Howdy readers, I'm Jason. This is chapter and verse. Uh, and as some of you know, uh, for my 500 uh, subscriber Q&A, uh, two of my subscribers asked uh, questions that were really quite similar to each other and uh, which I wanted to devote an entire video to. Uh, so Paperback Laura asked, uh, what is the book that most inspires you in your faith apart from the Bible? And Leonard Mayer asks, uh, which books or authors have influenced you the most in your own thinking about theology or religion? So this video um, is an attempt to answer those two questions in part, uh, in as far as I can in 15 minutes. So the first book I want to talk about is The Last Temptation of Christ by Nikos Kazantzakis. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this. Um, I've discussed it elsewhere uh, in other videos uh, in the past, and, um, and I'm planning to include it um, in great detail or greater detail in a uh, future video uh, that I'm planning to do maybe around next Easter. But uh, in short, um, reading this novel in my early 20s uh, revealed to me that, that I wasn't an atheist. Um, I had for some years up to that point um, considered myself an atheist and believed myself an atheist. And this novel showed me that I wasn't. Um, I wasn't sure I knew what to make of religion uh, or, or Jesus Christ as a figure. Um, but this novel uh, made me realize that, um, that I had dismissed it and him much too quickly. And it started a long journey uh, for me. Um, kind of not just rediscovering Christ, but really discovering Christ for the first time. Uh, despite all the church I had gone to as a teenager, um, I never really felt like I had a sense of Jesus until I read this book. Um, and now um, I would say that my own kind of vision of Jesus, my own understanding of Christ, is a kind of fusion of the uh, four portraits that we have of him in the Gospels and the portrait of him that we have in the Kazantzakis novel. So next, uh, I wanted to talk with you guys a little bit about A Generous Orthodoxy by Brian McLaren. So I read this book shortly after uh, becoming a Christian, uh, around about 13 years ago. And, um, and this book uh, reminds me, uh, reminded me then, and reminds me every time I think about it, that any Christian has a responsibility to let his or her faith be informed by not only all other Christian perspectives than the one he or she claims, but all other uh, religious and philosophical lenses as well. Basically, uh, we do Christ a disservice, I think, if we fail to find the constructive, uh, the life-giving, and the good in worldviews and approaches to life, philosophy, and religion um, that are different from our own. This is a book that reminds me uh, that faith should be uh, prismatic, that it shouldn't be insular, it shouldn't be exclusive, it shouldn't be singular. The next book I wanted to mention is this one here. This is Secrets in the Dark, A Life in Sermons by Frederick Beekner. Uh, now, when Kelly and I lived uh, in Missoula, the first year and a half or so that we were there, um, we just could not find a church. We just couldn't find a church. So we started a kind of house church um, with some friends of ours, some of my classmates from the English uh, MA program. And uh, we would read one of the sermons uh, from this book for every Sunday. We would get together uh, and have like a breakfast potluck at our apartment and discuss the sermon. And this book, uh, among many, many reasons to recommend it, uh, reminds me that uh, religion is at its best, faith is at its best, when it privileges curiosity and uncertainty uh, over absolutes. It's a book that understands uh, that faith should be um, a progress, uh, it should be a conversation, uh, rather than a staked out position. So I just want to read um, a little bit from this one here. And so this section is from probably my favorite of the essays or sermons uh, in this book. Um, and the piece is called Faith and Fiction. 
And Beekner writes this, Faith, therefore, is distinctly different from other aspects of the religious life, and not to be confused with them, even though we sometimes use the word to mean religious belief in general, as in phrases like the Christian faith or the faith of Islam. Faith is different from theology because theology is reasoned, systematic, and orderly, whereas faith is disorderly, intermittent, and full of surprises. Faith is different from mysticism because mystics in their ecstasy become one with what faith can at most see only from afar. Faith is different from ethics because ethics is primarily concerned not, like faith, with our relationship to God, but with our relationship to each other. Faith is closest, perhaps, to worship, because like worship, it is essentially a response to God and involves the emotions and the physical senses as well as the mind, but worship is consistent, structured, single-minded, and seems to know what it's doing, while faith is a stranger and exile on the earth and doesn't know for certain about anything. Faith is homesickness. Faith is a lump in the throat. Faith is less a position on than a movement toward, less a sure thing than a hunch. Faith is waiting. So that's Beekner. Um, it's a brilliant book, a brilliant book. Uh, if you go through, if we look at just the table of contents, uh, back when I read it years and years ago, I put little X's by my favorite uh, pieces. And almost everything has an X next to it so and then there's the angels in america plays by tony kushner these plays uh, remind me of the importance of humor in the face of the tragic these plays uh remind me that what feels like the end uh is never the end and they remind me that even one's uh fiercest enemy deserves uh, dignity. There's a scene uh, in these plays when uh, Roy Cohn dies, okay? Roy Cohn, um, who was responsible for or involved in uh, what happened to uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg uh, and their executions. And, um, and when Roy Cohn, the evil, nasty, gristle-hearted uh, Roy Cohn dies uh, in these plays, um, the nurse and uh, and his friend uh, who are present for it um, decide that that uh, that a prayer needs to be said uh, over his body, but Lewis, um, the friend, can't remember. I think it's the Kaddish. Um, yeah, I'm not as kind of up to speed on my Judaism as I should be. So he decides to to try to say it as best he can. And um, even though he thought Roy Cohn was just, you know, a miserable demon of a human being. And while he's making the attempt at saying the prayer, the ghost of Ethel Rosenberg, um, whose execution was orchestrated in part by Roy Cohn, um, stands behind Lewis and gives him the prayer to, to say over Roy Cohn's body. And I find that extraordinarily powerful, especially in a world where... Um, we look to strip all dignity away uh, from from our enemies, from our perceived enemies, and um, and we think that's somehow acceptable, um, and it's absolutely not. And these plays uh, remind me that um, that insisting on dignity um, is is completely knitted up uh, with religion and, uh, and with how we think about religion and our faith. And lastly, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, Christian Wyman, the poet Christian Wyman. All right, so I've got his collection of poems here, Every Riven Thing, and his memoir, uh, My Bright Abyss, Meditation of a Modern Believer. Um, so I'm just going to read you one of his poems, and, um, and then I'm going to read you a passage or two from this book. Uh, I'm also going to link in the description box below uh, one or two interviews with Christian Wyman. Um, I had to choose one contemporary figure uh, as a kind of intellectual guide um, in my faith, in my religion. Um, it would be Christian Wyman. All right, so I'm going to read you two poems. Every Riven Thing. God Goes. Belonging to every riven thing he's made sing his being simply by being the thing it is. 
stone and tree and sky, man who sees and sings and wonders why God goes. Belonging to every ribbon thing he's made means a storm of peace. Think of the atoms inside the stone. Think of the man who sits alone trying to will himself into a stillness where God goes belonging. To every ribbon thing he's made, there is given one shade, shaped exactly to the thing itself. Under the tree, a darker tree. Under the man, the only man to see God, goes belonging to every ribbon thing. He's made the things that bring him near, made the mind that makes him go, a part of what man knows, a part from what man knows. God goes belonging to every ribbon thing he's made. And then this is his poem called Lord is Not a Word. Lord is not a word. Song is not a salve. Suffer the child who lived on sunlight and solitude. Savor the man craving earth like an aftertaste. To discover in one's hand two local stones the size of a dead man's eyes saves no one. But to fling them with a grace you did not know you knew, to bring them skimming, homing over blue, is to discover the river from which they came. Mild, merciful amnesia through which I've moved as through a blue atmosphere of almost and was. How is it now? Like ruins unearthed by ruin, my childhood should rise. Lord, suffer me to sing these wounds by which I am made and marred. Savor this creature whose aloneness you ease and are. Let's see, and then from his memoir, I just love this. I just absolutely love this. Um, this is near the end of the memoir. It is not some meditative communion with God that I crave. What one wants during extreme crisis is not connection with God, but connection with people. Not supernatural love, but human love. No, that is not quite right. What one craves is supernatural love, but one finds it only within human love. This is why I am, such as I am, a Christian because I can feel God only through physical existence, can feel his love only in the love of other people. And then these two sentences, just two pages later. Christ is not alive now because he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. He rose from the dead 2,000 years ago because he is alive right now. So the writers of these books are some of my kind of religious or spiritual uh, mentors. And um, through them, through their books, through their poetry, um, in the case of Beekner, through his novels, um, I find my own uh, relationship with and engagement with and conversation with Christ to be um, deeper than it otherwise uh, might be and more complicated. Uh, than it otherwise might be. And I think that's what we should all um, kind of hope to have happen with our relationship uh, with Christ, is to see it deepened and complicated. So, But, uh, but by all means, uh, pick up some of these books. Uh, they're fabulous. If you're a believer, if you're not, um, or if you're just kind of searching, kind of seeking, kind of wondering, which is frankly what all of us should be doing. I hope this video was at least interesting. Adios.